Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to today's Talking Biopolitics event. We're really excited today to have uh, Alexandra Minister and Nathaniel Comfort both with, both with us in, and in conversation with each other and with you. And we'll be turning to them in just a couple minutes after some housekeeping announcements. And um, they'll be talking about politics for about 30 to 35 minutes. And then we'll take a very brief pause before bringing in your questions and comments. So that's the schedule for today. Um, let's see. We want to let you know a couple of housekeeping sorts of things. The first one is that at any point during this event, you can submit your comments and questions by typing them into the Q&A box that you see at the bottom right hand of your screen. So um, feel free to uh, submit those at any point, and we'll turn to them about uh, a little bit more than midway through the hour. Uh, I also want to let you know that this conversation is being recorded, and it will be archived on the Center for Genetics and Society YouTube channel and that we also have a live Twitter feed going. So if you like to multitask and contribute to that or let people who aren't near a computer know, they can follow on uh, the Twitter feed with the hashtag talking biopolitics. Okay, well one of the things I wanted to let you know is that we at this point have a real treasure chest of talking biopolitics conversations archived on the Center for Genetics and Society YouTube channel. And on your screen now, what you see are the past Talking Biopolitics conversations. They're roughly in chronological order with the most recent ones at the top, but they're, um, they're all really exceptional, um, exceptional conversations and uh, they're that you can uh, consult at any time. I also wanted to let you know a little bit about the Center for Genetics and Society. Uh, we're based in Berkeley, California. And we work for responsible uses and effective societal governance of human genetic and reproductive technologies. And we bring to those technologies and practices a set of values that you see listed there, social justice, human rights, ecological integrity, the common good, and democratic governance. And we really think that those values need to be at the forefront of assessing new human genetic and reproductive technologies, and that this really kind of constitutes a new biopolitics that we invite you to join us in building. What we do precise, more precisely is uh, work in uh, four major ways. One is we call our strategic communications work uh, involving media, online, social media, reports, writing, that kind of thing. We also um, have worked to build a network of uh, scholars and advocates to share our concerns and questions about um, these new biopolitical practices. Our third leg is policy advocacy, and we intervene in very carefully selected instances, um, and we've done so at the state, the national, and international levels. And finally, um, we are increasingly engaging in advocacy, what we call advocacy-oriented, and many people call advocacy-oriented research to try to fill some of the gaps that exist in our knowledge about um, how these technologies and practices are being implemented and experienced by people. So that's who CGS is. And now I'm going to have the honor of introducing our, pre today, our presenters today. So Nathaniel and Alex. Can you please start sharing your webcam so everyone can see you? And I'll come on shortly. Great. Great. Okay, I think everybody's here and microphones are unmuted for the presenters. I should have said for the participants, we do have everyone's microphones muted so that the audio quality is good for everyone, but uh, and that's why we invite you to submit your questions and comments by typing them in. But now it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce our two presenters. I'll start with Nathaniel. Nathaniel Comfort is a professor in the Department of the History of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University, and his research focuses on in 20th century America, also on the history of biology, especially genetics, molecular biology, and biomedicine, 
and the history of recent science and oral history and interviewing. And his most recent book, which we'll be talking about today, is The Science of Human Perfection, which science, the science journal described as, quote, a beautifully written account of how genes became central to American medicine. And that's actually Nathaniel's subtitle. Um, I, I wanted to also let you know that Nathaniel runs a blog called Genotopia, where he says his targets are hype, false promises, and hypocrisy. Good target. And he says on his blog, biomedicine and especially genetic medicine are among the most important and powerful cultural forces in our world today. At Genotopia, Nathaniel uses historical genomics, eugenics, oh, sorry, uh, Nathaniel uses historical context, commentary, and sometimes satire, I can attest to that, to shed light on issues such as personal genomics, eugenics, and human identity. And he regularly reviews books on genetics and the history of biology um, on his blog at Nature Magazine, at the New York Times, Sunday Book Review, NPR, The Believer, The Point, and other publications. So Nathaniel, welcome. And let me introduce mm -hmm. Alexandra Minister. Alex is Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, American Culture, Women's Studies, and History at the University of Michigan. Her research focuses on the history of eugenics and the uses and misuses of genetics in the United States and Latin America. And she's also written about the history of public health, uh, infectious diseases, and tropical medicine. Alex's most recent book is called Telling Genes, the Story of Genetic Counseling in America. And her earlier book is also germane to the conversation we'll have today. Its title is Eugenic Nation, Faults and Frontiers of Better Breeding in Modern America. This book is really a landmark contribution to the history of eugenics in the American West, especially in California. And she's currently revising it for a new edition. Alex has a website, and there she writes, I believe that historical research and analysis can provide important coordinates for understanding and navigating contemporary dilemmas in health, especially when it comes to reproductive health and genetic technology. So Alex, welcome. Both of you, you. welcome. And I wanted to give this extended, um, little, little bit extended introduction just to let people know um, really the scope of what you look at and the ways that you approach it. Um, because I, you know, I wanted to start by saying, before I turn it over to you, that not only are you both historians of science and medicine, you've both made, and, and not only have both of you made important contributions to uncovering and understanding the legacies of uh, the US eugenics movement of the 20th century, but you also have something else in common, and um, it's something that I hold in great esteem, is that you're both public intellectuals, that breed that we're always being told is close to extinction. Um, maybe you really are members <laughs> of an endangered species, and I actually expect there's a, no, a number of others um, that are on the line as participants on this call. But in any case, both of you are committed to to work that's both rigorous and accessible, and work that really engages the pressing, many of the pressing social questions of our time. And so you've already heard um, some of that in the introduction, but just a couple more points. Alex's work, um, recent work, helped educate legislators in California about a, a, a real scandal in our state, which is uh, unauthorized sterilizations of women taking place in the state's prison. Not when we're not talking the 20th century, we're talking a few years ago, or a number of years. And this is now, the, the legislators did pass the prohibition of this, so that was a really amazing example of public engagement. And Nathaniel's blog, and um, is also his, the way he engages with social and traditional media, um, really, I think, uh, is a way of exploring current issues, including controversies about race and genetics, and um, examples of genetic determinism, and provoking wider discussion of these. Um, we're also going to hear today about some of the ways that Alex and Nathaniel don't see things exactly the same. It's a big surprise. But just to continue for a moment with what they share with each other and also I think with what they share with CGS, both have really thought long and hard about the meaning of what, um, what it is sometimes called and what Nathaniel's book title calls the, the quest for human perfection. And they've also thought, um, as we have a CGS about the lessons that we should and should not draw 
from the eugenic movements of the 20th century and the eugenic impulses of the 21st century and about the uses and misuses of human genetic technologies as those technologies get ever more powerful and widespread. I think Nathaniel and Alex would agree with each other um, and with CGS that these issues are not just for history books. Um, coercive sterilization is still with us, amazingly enough. And we now have biotechnologies that allow us to select with increasing specificity the traits that we do and don't want in our children. Emerging precision gene editing technologies may actually force us to confront the prospect of engineering the traits of future generations, something that until recently we thought was a little bit far off. So these are really very consequential issues. And at CGS, we share Alice's and Nathaniel's fascination with them and concerns about them. And I'm really looking forward to hearing them um, talk about it right now. So I'm going to turn it over to them. And uh, um, Alex, I think you're going to take it from Great. There. Thank you for that. Uh wonderful and substantive introduction, and hello to everyone who's participating on this webinar. Um, Nathaniel, um, I very much enjoyed reading your book in various drafts and, you know, having the privilege of having it in my office right next to me now and have um, thought about it a lot. And one of the arguments you make in your book is kind of the strand that runs through it is that um, you know, at the core of the development of modern genetics sits that eugenic impulse. And it is wrapped up in two kind of streams. One is um, the pursuit of human improvement, or let's say human perfection. And the other is the very understandable desire to relieve human suffering from disease and illness. And with those two threads, you know, you move us you know, very elegantly from the past into the present and allow us to think about the future. And I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about where you see that argument in the present today and also as you look forward to the future. As we know, genetics and genomics often offers promises and itself is very much of a futuristic science. Okay, thanks. Uh, Yes, I too want to welcome everybody and uh, you, Alex, and thanks to Marcy uh, for organizing this. Um, yeah, that's actually a question that's uh, quite important to me. I do see uh, the you know, what I call these these two or what you've you called these two pillars uh, of um, human improvement and the release of suffering uh, as being common to old school eugenics of the early 20th century and the progressive era and all the way up through today. And so yes, very much I see those kinds of things um, still with us uh, through a number of different, um, a, a different media. And, and I think you can look at ways in which we still see, uh, we, we see efforts to improve, um, you know, to reduce human suffering. That's pretty straightforward. And ways that we still see uh, uh, the efforts at human improvement. And then I think there's some a lot of topics that really show elements of both. So I want to sort of stress the, the, the complicated nature of a lot of these things, that, that it's not one or the other. In many cases, it's both. So for example, um, you know, uh, whole exome sequencing is where they uh, will sequence your, your uh, all of the DNA in your genome that is, it's about 2% that is, that codes for proteins. And this is becoming, you know, this was uh, a science fiction even just a few years ago. And when I was um, out at Baylor College of Medicine a few weeks ago, talking with um, scientists and genetic counselors there, they said that it's becoming just a standard of care in the genetic school there. So, you know, this and the effort there is to identify uh, genes or, or, or gene mutations in, um, in newborns and in children primarily and uh, it, it, in order to better identify uh, disease processes and hopefully initiate therapies and, and so forth. So that's kind of thing um, that we see as, you know, in the very much 
suffering. On the other uh, a, a resurgence of what scholars call scientific racism these days. Uh, and, and you know, many people have heard of the uh, Richard Hurst and Charles Murray book, The Bell Curve, that came out in 1994. Uh, last summer, there was another book by the New York Times site. Um, same argument for that were in the bell curve and basically argued you know, that uh, white people have come out on top in society uh, because we're genetically you know, programmed to do so. And uh, a, a new graduate student in our program has shown um, that the sources that Wade was drawing upon were in the same tradition and, in fact, in many cases, the same sources that uh, Ernst Dean and Murray were using for, for the bell curve. So you know, these kinds of questions aren't just part of the past. They, they cycle through. They recur constantly in history. So I think we need to put these issues in historical context in order to better understand them. Yeah. Uh, I'll continue. And, well, I was just going to uh, sort of bounce that back to you. Uh, and and you know, it seems to me that some of your work uh, Current, your current work also addresses the tension between these two goals. It right? does. Um, it's interesting because, well, I'll just start off by saying that when one is studying this, there's always something timely in the news, um, almost every day. And I'm very happy to report that yesterday, uh, Virginia, the legislature, and the governor agreed on a compensation package for victims of forced sterilization. Um, it's about, it looks like not as much money as was allocated in North Carolina, but nonetheless, you know, a good sum of money to compensate those, you know, who were sterilized by the state as part of the program from the 1920s to the 1970s. So there's an instance where, you know, eugenic and eugenic sterilization comes right back into the news and where you have people, you know, survivors um, who are you know, very much told their stories and have been part of that whole process of, uh, of acquiring the compensation and, and were successful at that. So with that as kind of a backdrop, you know, when I finished my first book and then started to work on my second book, part of what I wanted to do was tease out um, some of the continuities and the discontinuities between the eugenics of the early and mid 20th century and the emergence of, you know, more medicalized or scientific genetics, especially vis-a-vis -vis genetic counseling. And there certainly are a whole variety of differences and priority, priorities and, and value sets that influence both of those. For, for, you know, quite a while I kind of just, you know, what we had in the past was eugenics with a capital P you know, in the past, taking us through the 1970s up until the 1970s, emergence and consolidation of bioethical principles, which are, you know, under, are undergirding, hopefully, of, of medical of genetics, and then what we're experiencing today is E. But I, I would have to say that now I'm more pessimistic, um, and I've become more pessimistic mystic over the past uh, several years, both because of what we saw in California with the um, sterilization in the prison. And I, I'm not convinced that those sterilizations were 100% eugenic sterilizations, but they share enough of the values and, you know, the assumptions and the priorities around who is fit to be a parent, children, in a very racial fashion that you can't but see, you know, kind of a direct line from what was going on in a place like Sonoma or Stockton in the 1930s and what was going on in Valley State Prison for Women in the early 2000s. Um, in addition, you know, what you mentioned about, you know, this kind of insidious and more cleverly packaged form of scientific racism, you know, I find that it abounds and it even it appears in ways that are can be difficult to pinpoint and to challenge. 
And that is something that actually concerns me. So now, you know, I feel like I'm in a constant place of reevaluating um, what eugenics looked like then and what eugenics looks like now. And I'll just add one other point that you might have some thoughts about, which is that, um, you know, one of the ways in which um, thinkers have made a distinction between then and now is that then was, you know, heavy-handed, coercive, and necessarily involved the role of the state. And now is potentially an era of more privatized eugenics where people, you know, are exercising choices and people should be exercising reproductive choices. Um, and also, but we also have as part of that an increasing commercialization of genetics. So that new genetic technologies are coming from, um, you know, are coming out of, uh, you know, kind of genetic companies and some of which are developing very good tools and it's not to condemn all of them, but it's to say what is this pattern that we're seeing in terms of, you know, where are these new products coming from? How are they arriving, you know, at the desk and clinics and laboratories of the genetic health professionals that use them, and what are their implications for, um, you know, how patients and or clients, as they like to be called, will use them. So that whole wave of commercialization is something that concerns me. We could just start off by identifying it as a potential conflict of interest issue, but I think it actually goes deeper than that, and it poses one of these very interesting questions. So I'll kind of throw that back at you with a half question um, and see where you might take that. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on this. I, I think that uh, we need to be really clear about, I mean, I like you're talking about uh, big E eugenics and little e eugenics. Um, Raymond Pearl in the 1920s made the same distinction. Uh, he talked about the old eugenics movement as a sort of social political movement as capital E eugenics. And he said, you know, by the late 1920s, he was writing that that's, that's bankrupt and that's over and done. However, little e eugenics, meaning, you know, the, the uh, ways of using genetic knowledge to to better society and uh, and so forth, you know, was still something he very much believed in. So he could repudiate one and and accept the other, and he is by no means the only one who's done that. Um, so I think we need to be really clear on what we mean by eugenics, and there are a lot of different different definitions of eugenics possible. Uh, as you point out, for a lot of historians, eugenics is fundamentally about the state control over, over reproduction. Um, no state control, no eugenics, right? Uh, I prefer a definition from the 1921 Eugenics Congress, which is that eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. And that, and I like that definition because A, eugenicists themselves came up with it, but B, because it spans the history of eugenics from, you know, from Francis Galton in the 19th century uh, all the way up to today. We're still trying to control our own evolution, I, you know, in, in many ways more than ever. Um, in the progressive era, they had pretty crude and brutal tools of doing that. They needed to control people's bodies, right? through uh, marriage and immigration restrictions, through sterilization, and so forth. Today's science can control fertilization. Can, we can map and sequence genomes, and we can even edit genes. And so you know, that's, that's a very different way of practicing some of the same, of trying to reach some of the same goals. Um, further, I would say that society has moved from collectivism to individualism. Right? And the progressive era was very, very based on state control. And, and today we are much more individualistic. And so um, controlling our own ev evolution through individual choice and through market forces is often called liberal eugenics. I would call it neoliberal eugenics. Uh, the cheerleaders for these methods reassure us 
that there's every difference between the bad old collectivist eugenics and the shiny neoliberal eugenics. Some difference between them, but I think the ethical problems evolve rather than disappear. Yeah, I, I would, um, I like the way in which you lay that out and, and, but to throw another, you know, complication in there, you know, we can talk about kind of liberal, let's say privatized eugenics or, you know, eugenically inflected choices that um, people might be making in the context of genetic tests or prenatal testing or technologies. One of the things that I've sought to do in my work is to put that in conversation with thinking about, you know, what I would call from a feminist perspective of thinking about reproduction and particularly reproductive justice. So another trend that you see happening right now that I think we need to, historical schools to understand is um, what's happening this week in Ohio, which is that the legislature there is attempting to pass a bill that would ban women from terminating pregnancies with trisomy 21. That follows on the heel of a similar bill in North Dakota, which prohibits women from um, uh, terminating pregnancies um, because, with, because of sex selection or, you know, kind of a vague term of fetal anomaly. So you have this, you know, basically this convergence of you know, anti-abortion, the anti-abortion legislation, which is coming down state by state. I mean, over 30 states over the past two years, you know, over 200 of these different types of restrictive bills have been passed. And they're often looping in um, issues around, um, you, know, you know, protecting the disabled, not letting another Holocaust occur, and things like that. Um, and that is a real tension between, you know, in kind of the, our, let's look at the modern, um, you know, today at the kind of the political landscape where you get a real, you know, tension between, you know, reproductive rights and disability rights. And, you know, I would view the bill in Ohio as a place in which there is, you know, really a problematic intertwining of those two coming together. So when it comes to issues of control, or let's say reproductive control vis-a-vis -vis genetics, if you broaden that out and think about reproductive uh, control more generally, you will find so many instances, just one after one, where that has actually tightened rather than loosened. And when there, you know, is, you know, a, a constriction of um, not only kind of choices, but also access and availability of reproductive services. You know, it's often painted as it's just a reduction of, you know, places where there are abortion providers, but in the grand scheme of things, we're talking about, you know, the restriction of a whole range of services for women in their reproductive years. And so that's something that I have struggled with is to um, use historical frameworks and historical tools to understand that type of the intertwining that we're seeing in the early uh, you know, in the early 2000s now between reproductive rights um, and, and disability rights where they clash and, um, and where, where you find them coming together in, in complicated ways. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I, I saw those stories myself and, um, and and yeah, I mean, I think we can see those as uh, as efforts by uh, by certain members in the in in state legislatures, you know, um, to kind of regressively impose those kinds of uh, controls over over bodies, uh, like the like. Like I did in the progressive era, and so I, I, I see that tension very much in those kinds of terms um, that I was describing. I, I think you're absolutely right, and you know the tension to me is, uh, or at least one way of of, of uh, expressing that tension is, how do we want to proceed as a society? Are we going to are we going to uh, enable these newer Technological techniques for um, for for 
making choices about uh, uh, you know who we're going to kind of allow into the next generation. Is that going to be up to the, the choice of the individual, the parents, uh, and so forth, or are the states going to try to roll back the clock and take us back to the progressive era? Yeah, I mean, um, those are big questions. And um, but I want to uh, I wanted to ask you about something else, um, just because we've covered a lot about the state and thinking about reproduction and the differences between old and new eugenics. And um, I know that one of the things that you've covered in your blogs um, in a very engaging and enlightening way has been the saga with James Watson. Um, of his fall from grace and also the Nobel Prize that he sold but then didn't really sell. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that whole episode and how you think that fits into the way in which people either perceive him and also perceive his legacy. Yeah, sure. Uh, that was a, a very fascinating uh, set of events. Um, Watson, uh, the last most people heard of Jim Watson was in 2007 when he was, uh, when he was summarily deposed from uh, the chancellorship of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where he, uh, which he had, you know, led for the previous uh, almost 50 years. Um, for making public remarks uh, on a book tour that suggested that um, that blacks were of lower intelligence inherently, you know, genetically than than whites, and that was just too much for the um, for the trustees of the laboratory, and they said, you know, okay, enough, and uh, and and removed him as chancellor, and uh, then this fall he. Uh, goes back in the news again for um, uh, auctioning off his Nobel Prize medal, and that stimulated a whole bunch of uh, uh, of media coverage, and it was uh, you know a buzz all over social media as well, and everybody was speculating about his um, uh, about his motives for this, and every. Everything he made, everything statement he made, seemed to dig him in deeper. You know, he made these remarks about wanting to buy a David Hockney painting and and so forth, and and people leapt all over that. And I got to to be sort of a, a historian on the ground. And I could imagine, um, you know, going to going to stand next to Napoleon at Waterloo or something, you know, and uh, and and get to observe it. Firsthand and, and talk to him about it. Um, so I got to, to observe what was going on there and, uh, and and participate in it and and write about it. And one of the things that uh, that we had talked about a little bit was um, before this was whether this makes Watson seem a um, you know just an anomaly and a and a crackpot, or uh, or is he, or or can we learn something larger about the role of genetics in late 20th, 21st century science? And I wouldn't be following this if I if I didn't think that there was some relevance there. Um, and I think he's far from an outlier. I, I think he's in many ways a very typical man of 20th century biomedicine. Uh, he shows in extreme form some intellectual and social commitments that are utterly characteristic of much of the rise of DNA science in the late 20th century. And so, um, you know, what he, he's a man who, who just doesn't have filters, right? So he says exactly what he thinks, and what he thinks is, and what he says is what a lot of people in who've sort of been who've been dominant in the rise of molecular uh, biomedicine and DNA science have been, you know, thinking and saying uh, themselves. The the uh, 
remarks that come off as sexist and, and racist and so forth are, you know, uh, you know, I think any feminist would, would recognize those as being highly characteristic of the, uh, of the you know, dead white men who've run uh, most of, uh, who've, who've been in charge of the biomedical enterprise of the second half of the 20th century. Um, and furthermore, the, the, he shows, I think, what happens when somebody was very typical and not terribly reflective views on issues such as race and gender and intelligence studies genes too much. Um, you know, the, so he sees, he tends to see everything in terms of genetics. And if there's a quality, it, there, it must be, there must be a gene for that, you know. And so I think Watson is really a lens on both the, both the, 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 the good qualities and some of the negative qualities of the rise of the Yeah, thank you for that. It really provides an interesting insight to the kind of reductionism that he, you know, brought to his thinking, and that is characteristic of some of genetic medicine, but not a great deal of it, which tends to be, you know, kind of more thinking about uh, multifactorial inheritance and things that much more in terms of variation and difference. So that is very intriguing. Now it's the time for us to take a little break um, and read some of the questions that our, um, that our, that our guests have, have posted. And so we'll be back in a few minutes to, uh, to take some of those up. Alex and Nathaniel, that okay. was great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And we do have some great questions coming in. And please, everyone who's listening, this is um, a really good time to type your questions into that Q&A box at the bottom. And um, Alex and Nathaniel will take a look at those. As, um, there's just a couple other things I wanted to let you all know about. One is that we're going to be sending you some links to more resources and information about Nathaniel and his work and Alex and her work. Um, the links that you see there on your screen are live, but we'll also be sending this to you in a follow-up email. And uh, the Center for Genetics and Society, um, as many of you might know, we have a website full of resources and a whole section on eugenics and biotechnology as well. And um, I just also wanted to let you know about ways that you can stay involved with um, these conversations and the work around uh, new biopolitics and uh, human genetic technologies and reproductive technologies. We do have a newsletter that comes out every other week that will give you um, a quick way to stay up to date on how these issues are being discussed in the media. We've got our Twitter, our Facebook, and our Google Plus pages. And I mentioned our website. We have a blog that um, has new entries on it from our staff and guest contributors um, several times a week. And we also ask that if you can donate to help us with our work, we would very, very deeply appreciate it. So um, that's really what I wanted to say during this seventh hour. We now have a little bit more time to bring your questions and comments into this conversation. And this is great. Um, let's see. So OK, so let me um, start with this question. Um, it's a question about historical under what, what you know, the historical understanding of the history of eugenics in America. And this person asks, how might that have been shaped by Cold War politics? And he and he says he's thinking about this specifically in the context of patterns of social of historical amnesia that um, he often encounters in people when exploring this history. And I would add to that, I wonder, I, both of you have been teaching these issues also for, for some time, and I wonder how your students receive this information and whether, whether that's changed over the years. Is there less awareness, more awareness? So, Alice, you want to start? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I would say that, you know, there's a few ways to approach that. The first is, is that, you know, as we know from eugenicists themselves and from historical work on eugenics that the post-war period was a time when, in which this, you know, liberalization of eugenics occurred, which eugenicists themselves taught, sought to put it, you know, more in sync with uh, democracy and often, 
you know, some of the most prominent eugenicists, um, you know, had more racially liberal views and, let's say, more, um, you know, capacious understandings of human difference. At the same time, you know, there was a way in which the Cold War mentality in the United States, particularly around the family, and the idea of, you know, kind of the idealized nuclear family, the idea that, you know, middle class European Americans should be having 2.1 kids, and, you know, still that people with, you know, disabilities, et cetera, were generally, you know, sent to institutions. There was a, was a normalizing effect of, you know, what we could call this, you know, emergent liberal eugenics in the, um, in the second half of the 20th century. One could say that that muted, it, certain, it certainly muted, you know, kind of the uglier tendencies of the eugenics of the 20s and 30s so that people did start to forget at it. And then, you know, there's been an ebb and flow in terms of this question of historical memory. You know, if you, you know, do Google News right now and put in Virginia and sterilization, you're going to remember eugenics because we're going to talk about the fact that this compensation package was just passed. But then nothing could happen, you know, for another, you know, few months, another few years, and, you know, it could be kind of tucked away into the past. One of the things that I've struggled with with my work, and this pertains to thinking about California, is in states such as Virginia or North Carolina where you have compensation packages, that is the result in part of the fact that you have um, living victims of sterilization who have immobilized with, um, you know, advocates and scholars and others to get, you know, bills on the table to get historical plaques uh, on the ground, things like that. In California, um, there is no one has come forward. One person of 20,000 people has come forward and told his story publicly, despite the fact that there have been attempts to capture these stories. So in California, where you had, you know, the largest number of sterilizations and a very kind of active eugenics movement, um, it's you know, there's a real risk of forgetting because you don't have those active participants <coughs> who are there to remind us and to remember to remember the past. And I'm going to cough now, so I'll stop for a second. Nathaniel, do you want to take a crack at that? Okay. Yeah, sure. I, I can chime in here on at a, another perspective. I think that you know, Alex's points were really excellent. Um, another thing we could throw into that. Um, again, uh, going back to the ways that historians have conceived of eugenics, um, I think it's very much been shaped by, the, I think the historiography on genetics has been very much shaped by Cold War politics. Uh, eugenics didn't really become a sort of dirty word uh, until about the 1970s. And that was the result of uh, a number of historians looking back and sort of uh, putting eugenics into the context of the Holocaust. And um, in the in the 50s and 60s, surprisingly, it was uh, it, eugenics was much more talked about than than most people realize. And then from the 70s till about the end of the the, the century. Uh, eugenics was very much a kind of dirty word. It was taboo. You wouldn't talk about it. It was, um, you know, it, it, it basically godwinned any uh, any conversation. It, you know, that internet meme where anything uh, left, uh, any internet discussion eventually winds up talking about Hitler. Um, and so as far as historical amnesia, what's been interesting to me is that since the turn of the 21st century, eugenics has started to creep back into uh, the scientific literature. And uh, and even some others outside of science, sort of, uh, science writers and, uh, and a few others, have been talking about eugenics again in a way that they never would have done during, say, the 1980s. Uh, and so this is so we had this resurgence of eugenic ideas and people going back and saying you know some of those old eugenicists from the from the progressive era like Charles Davenport who uh, was sort of the dean of the the American eugenics movement during the progressive era he, maybe he wasn't so bad after all and uh, maybe he had some 
some things to, to teach us. And uh, we see the rise of liberal eugenics and uh, this new individualized kind of eugenics. And so what fascinates me as a historian and, and what motivates me to, to keep talking about this in public uh, forums such as this is that you know, again, and they're forgetting they're forgetting the past and saying, well, you know, maybe eugenics has uh, has has a sound core, you know, and that's isn't that a, a, a troubling a, a troubling uh, development? Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, let's actually for the next question turn our focus from the past to the future, and this question is whether um, either of you believe that these new gene editing technologies like CRISPR have, I think first the questioner is saying, the technical capacity to engineer babies and making them smarter or sportier or even more attractive. What's your assessment of CRISPR and precision gene editing? Uh, I can jump in here first, maybe, if Alex, Alex you want to uh, chime in as well. Um, that's a great question and one that I'm, uh, I'm actively studying right now. Um, so I've got some preliminary thoughts on that, but I, my, my thinking is, is changing rapidly on this. Um, but right now I would say uh, that it's entirely possible, it, it will result in the ability to try to engineer babies. Um, and my guess is that it probably won't work the way people think it will. Uh, biology always tends to uh, throw curveballs at you. It always turns out to be a lot more complex than you thought. And uh, you know, you if you if you try to tweak it, you know, there's a there's a a particular form of a gene that supposedly raises your IQ by eight to ten points, um, and you know you'd think, well, uh, who wouldn't want to have a smarter child, right? Well, we don't know what else that gene does. It's not an IQ gene, right? Uh, if if that result holds up and proves to be robust, that that gene might have all sorts of other that we can't foresee. So the law of unintended consequences um, always kicks in and bites you in the behind when you're when you're fooling around with this stuff. We had this idea that that genes uh, gene are there sort of coding for traits that we that we identify, but we determine what those traits are. The genes don't know what we think they code for, right? The genes are just doing what they do, and so. I think it's very likely that we will that we will attempt the, the, the technology is there absolutely to to engineer uh, embryos and try to tweak them and, and enhance their uh, and enhance them in one way or another and beyond a few you know a, a, a really dwindling number of pretty simple genetic diseases and traits. Um, I think it's going to turn out to be a lot more complicated than we thought. Yeah. Alex, here's one I think is really directed at um, what your remarks. Um, this person says, I'm really glad you mentioned the perceived tensions between disability rights and reproductive justice. She says, in many ways, I believe this is a false dichotomy. Generally, the disability community is supportive of reproductive rights, but prenatal testing can perpetuate ableist ideologies similar to those that resulted in the eugenics movement. And nonetheless, I think these communities must come together to actually address the eugenic ideologies that we're seeing now. Do you have any comments about that? Or I do, and I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate your point because I think it's very well taken that it is a false dichotomy. I mean, I think one of the most productive exercises that you can do and also that scholarship has brought us um, focused on eugenics, but also institutionalization and other forms of health and medicine, is to basically, you know, see the his if you look at the history of genetics and also the history of eugenics through a disability studies lens, you will see continuities. 
all the way through in terms of who is determined to be worthy, normal, abnormal, and whose life is seen as, you know, valuable and worth living. And I always try to keep that flame lit when I'm doing my uh, research and my analysis. And also then to bring that into conversation and play with thinking about, you know, reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Where things, when you throw a wrench into that, once you add in genetic selection and particularly prenatal testing, things get very complicated and things can get very contested, even if this is a false dichotomy, just by the virtue of the fact that we're talking about technologies that we can argue should be part of a, you know, equitable, uh, equitably available repertoire of, you know, reproductive technologies available to all women who want to access them, but they come with a series of implications and outcomes, if you look at the research, whereby, you know, the latest, you know, studies from 2012, 2013 show that 60 to 80 percent of, you know, uh, amniocentesis where fetuses are detect, diagnosed with uh, trisomy 21 are, end up to be terminated pregnancies. So I think that is, there's just a tension there. I think some of it is a false dichotomy in terms of the movements themselves, but the tension around the issues is there. And in one of the things that I, in my second book, really tried to do was to understand how do genetic counselors approach this. And this is a field where initially genetic counselors, especially when the field started in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, had what we could say an anti-disability perspective. That has really shifted over time where, you know, you still have some presumptions about, you know, um, you know, certain types of disabilities, you know, needing to be prevented. But you really have a good number of genetic counselors that are working hard to have, um, you know, I would say a much more kind of accepting understanding and a disability-friendly uh, understanding. But that's really hard when you're talking about prenatal testing. It's a really difficult situation, and it becomes even more difficult when all these new, when new technologies come down the pike such as, you know, the, um, the, new, types, the new types of, of prenatal testing, you know, the, the fetal cell um, uh, testing that we've seen over the past two years that, you know, basically arrive at the desks of genetic counselors with instructions on how to use them, and then they need to figure out what to do and what the implications are, and their patients often have seen them because they have, you know, seen uh, commercials for them and they've learned about them through the grapevine. So I really appreciate your question. I think that I could talk about that particular issue for a long time, and I'd like to talk to you more about it, because I think we all, it's something where we need to have more conversation and get to a better place. Well, actually, here's another question that's kind of a follow-up to that one, and, and I think both of you might want to comment on it. Um, and, and the question is, what, what does it mean? How do we understand it that the right wing is offering opposition to eugenics? as part of its campaign to control women's reproduction. Alex, you want to go first? Well, I think that that actually, you know, can be traced back quite a way. I mean, there's a few ways of reading that. One is that eugenics in that form becomes kind of women's health and reproductive health and antipathy towards that, whether it's cast as Margaret Sanger in the 1920s or Planned Parenthood in 2010. So you have to see it as part of what, you know, someone like um, Lynn Paltrow from National Advocates for Pregnant Women has called, you know, the new, uh, the new Jane Doe. So you can see it in that perspective. Um, the other thing is that, you know, there is a there can be, and I don't want to overstate the case, but there can be a um, religious component to some of the conservatism that supports the legislation that we've talked about that does have certain perspectives on, you know, valuing life and the sanctity of life. I think we need to have conversations where we really engage those viewpoints and take them seriously for what they are, coming from religious perspectives, and again, try to come to a better place with them. But in general, a lot of what's going on right now with things like these bills in Ohio and North Dakota, they're pulling in genetic selection, they're pulling in these other elements, 
but you know I view them as part of really you know an anti-feminist backlash that um, has been you know particularly intense um, for the past you know five ten years. Then I would just, yeah. yeah, I would just add very, just add very briefly to that that um, you know the that eugenics still is in many it, for many people is still a dirty word, and I think they can you know by it's it's like it's like the conservatives' nuclear option when it comes to uh, when it comes to re reproductive um, you know reproductive rights, and you know when I say that I see eugenics beginning to work its way back into um, uh, uh, scientific and, and public conversations, I'm talking about still a pretty thin slice uh, of people who are, are, are deeply involved in, usually in genetic research somehow. Um, and, and I think that's the beginning of the wedge, and it's, it's probably trickling down slowly. But there's still a large sector of the population for whom, as soon as you mention eugenics, it's just, you know, that makes it evil by, by definition. Okay, well, let me ask you to share with us, if you're willing to, a little bit about where your work is taking you and what, what we should look forward to as you continue on your research path. Um, Nathaniel? Sure. Uh, my current project is a biography of DNA. And so uh, I'm I'm looking at the at, at DNA as as a molecule with with a life uh, that you know the molecule it's often called the molecule of life or the secret of life, and so I'm kind of riffing on that and saying well let's look at it as an object that that has a biography, and so I'm I'm looking at the history of DNA and DNA research uh, in four different but overlapping stages, uh, DNA as a natural object, looking at how we come to understand the origins of DNA and the origins of life, DNA as a scientific object, uh, the, the history of the discovery of DNA uh, as a molecule in the nucleus of cells, all the way up through the history of biochemistry and the solution of the structure of DNA. DNA as a cultural object. How did DNA become DNA? You know, uh, the the I, I've got sitting on my um, on my desk a a bottle of DNA soda, and I have a bottle of DNA perfume in my office at work. And you know, see DNA uh, it, it as a it it becomes a notion uh, an expression of our identity. Right? And so how did we go from DNA as a scientific object to this cultural object that comes to define who we are? Uh, and finally, DNA as an artificial object. Uh, in very recent years, we've started using DNA as a, as a tool, as a computer, as a building block, uh, and, and you know, an engineering device. And so I think that all of these different histories of DNA are, are intertwined, if I may, uh, in a sort of a, uh, you know, four-stranded helix. And so I'm going to be, I think that looking at, nobody's really put all of these histories together. There are scientific histories, there are cultural histories, but no one's really shown how they, how those interact. And so I, I think that we can learn a lot about the meaning of DNA and of genetics in society by looking at it uh, in this in, in this Great, biographical context. That. And Alex, you want to just very on? quickly? I have two projects I'm working on. One is working with about 15,000 sterilization records from the state of California, doing qualitative and quantitative analysis. Preliminary findings show disproportionate sterilization of Spanish surnames patients and a variety of other things that I will be publishing and I will be happy to keep you posted on. And the second is actually looking at, you know, kind of the more optimistic and, um, uh, you know, positive side of genetics, which is the role of genetics in the pursuit of social justice and a restorative justice. 
particularly in the uses of forensic anthropology and DNA identification of, um, you know, families that were torn apart in the context of dictatorship or war. So I'm also moving in that direction and doing some international research. That sounds fascinating. Okay, well, we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to have to wrap up, and I want to end by thanking you both. This was really great, and I also want to thank everyone who participated. Um, there were a lot of great questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. I'll pass those on to Alex and Nathaniel, and I want to just remind you that um, all, this conversation will be available on CGS's YouTube channels, and the past ones are as well, and that we'll be sending you a link to um, uh, an email with a follow-up link that we showed you on the screen today. When, you, when we end in a second here, you're going to be redirected to a short survey about this event and future Talking Biopolitics possibilities, and we really value your feedback. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks.